thank you sir for the kind introduction uh, it's uh, my privilege to be uh, here for this conference esteemed conference in fact uh, my presentation today is my presentation today is uh, mainly about bobat approach and it's more of a practical uh, approach uh, presentation but we, i'll just rush through few slides so that one minute i am just going to uh, i will have to share my screen yes so my topic for today is uh, rebuild the forgotten path pathways of brain and body in no time using bobat approach so it will be a practical demonstration but i'll just go through few slides so that everybody has an idea about what we do in bobat approach so why am i here today i am not here to teach or preach anything new but i am here to share with you all my experiences and my learnings neuro rehab as we all know is as vast as ocean and in fact according to me all of us are still learning so here is my attempt to clear some concepts and to try some light try and throw some light on bobat approach in neuro rehabilitation just to go back to the history of bobat the concept was devised by carol bobat and bertha bobat in as early as 1977 and this was one of the foremost concepts in which the treatment was concentrated on the affected side and that is why the concept started gaining lot of importance in neuro rehab because most of the concepts or treatment approaches which were followed before this used to have more of compensatory techniques using the normal side for function and this was the first approach or foremost approach where they started working on the motor recovery of the affected side and that's why it started gaining a lot of importance but if you consider from 1977 till now the concept has really evolved over time that time or even in our college days it was the concept name was reflex inhibiting patterns now it's no more called called as reflex inhibiting patterns because why the reflex the name itself reflex inhibiting pattern you need to have some baseline tone to inhibit something so that name started giving a wrong impression about the concept that the bobat concept cannot be used in patients with no tone or flaccid patients and that's why the concept name evolved and changed from reflex inhibiting patterns to tone influencing pattern because we have been using these approaches for flaccid patients now what is tone influencing pattern tone influencing pattern is when you are treating a patient you have to identify what activity you are going to train suppose if i am training an activity of standing standing requires more tone or less tone what does it require standing requires to build up tone in your body so you need to give the patient exercises which are going to help up help build up tone in the patient's body similarly if i have to do an activity of releasing something if i have to release what does it require releasing requires more tone or less tone a activity of release will need let go of the tone in your body you need to reduce the tone in your body and that's why as a therapist i'm going to give those patients exercises which are going to reduce the overall tone in their body so that they are able to do the activity of release and that's what is tone influencing pattern it's the ability of the therapist to identify the activity which you are training and regulate the tone in the patient's body so that they are able to do that function now definition if you see these two gentlemen if they want to shake hands with each other what will they have to do first and foremost is they have to maintain that particular posture to shake hands with each other and that postural control plays a very very important role when you are training a patient using bobat concept so it's a problem solving approach to the assessment and treatment of individuals with disturbances of function movement and postural control so that postural control plays a very important role when you are training a patient using the bobat concept so as we 
all know different patients have different demands and different needs so there is no specific treatment offered to a means there is no fixed menu different patients will come with different demands and the treatment is structured according to their demands or the treatment needs to be flexible according to their demands so your treatment has to be adapted to meet those individuals changing needs now for a concept to be accepted worldwide there has to be a model which has to support that concept so in case of bobat concept we use the systems model which is a constant interaction between the individual the task and the environment in which you work so if you consider this individual he has been given a task of walking if you see there are two slides the right slide he is walking relax no problem and on the slide uh, on the picture on the left hand slide uh, left hand side he is walking with his outstretched hands the face is not visible but he was looking down to concentrate using his vision to balance he is using his proprioceptive system to balance so did we so i had not told him to do this this was his own body reaction depending on the demand placed on his body so what i did was i just constrained the environment in which he was walking and his body reacted or responded to that demand and that's called a systems model so systems model is a non hierarchical self organizing system driven by multi sensory inputs musculoskeletal system vision auditory system proprioception everything is used depending on the demand placed on the body so it's very important to use this in your clinical practice so if a patient is absolutely low tone not able to balance acute stage you will not make them walk in the center rather you will make them walk somewhere where they are more dependent he can get some uh, good close hold of the wall similarly if you are training a patient who has already started walking but you need to train them for balance so you can challenge them with changing the environment you can make them walk with obstacles slippery floors so this is how you can use the systems model in your clinical practice assessment so again in bobat patients when we treat them with bobat approach we follow the icf model same thing participation restriction activity limitation underlying impairment so when a patient comes to you you ask either the patient or the patient's caregiver that what activity did the patient participate before the episode of stroke and whether he is able to participate in that activity now or no so suppose a patient is a housewife so what activity normally does a housewife do they do more of we can take an activity of cooking so whether the patient is able to do cooking right now or no if yes it will come under her participation if no then it will come under her participation restriction why is she not able to do cooking what do you need to do what activities you need to stand near a kitchen platform you need to do a reach you need to do grasping gripping activities whether she is able to do those activities right now or no whether she is able to stand whether she is able to reach whether she is able to grasp if able to do it will come under her activities if unable to do it will come under her activity limitation why is she not able to do a reach why is she not able to stand high tone less tone tightness more spasticity flexibility pain all those things will come under her underlying impairments now when you are treating the patient you have to go the reverse way you have to make sure you normalize the tone you reduce the pain you work on the flexibility so that the patient is able to do those activities which were limited and once they are able to do those activities they can participate in their function now my talk is more about bobat key points and for facilitating the key points or facilitating a movement using the key points first of all we all should know what is a normal movement because when you treat the patients there is no movement possible in them and then if we don't don't know what is normal movement we won't be able to do the facilitations and that's why a normal movement is important we need to know what is normal movement so normal movement can be considered as a skill acquired through learning for the purpose of achieving the most efficient and economical movement or performance of a task which is very specific to the individual so there is some variation in the normal movement but most of the movements 
work in the same components they use the same components like for eating we always eat like this for combing hair most of us use the same components for combing hair so these components are been used because we are going to these components are used because we are going to train the patient using these components so, yeah. so just for your example if i have to do shake hands so if we need to shake hands with a person in front of me normal movement what will happen is the body segments will always move in alignment and distal component moves first so normally in a normal movement the distal component moves first and then the proximal component follows imagine a patient doing shake hands with you what happens they move this way the shoulder goes up then the then the elbow starts coming ahead so the proximal component moves first now degree of freedom shoulder has flexion abduction all these degrees of freedom but when you shake hand you don't go into that abduction and shake hand you just come ahead and shake hands so what we do is we control the degree of freedom on your shoulder we don't we are not been told to control the degree uh, control the degree of freedom but we are controlling that degree of freedom and that is again a part of normal movement control over your degree of freedom so that the task is more economical less energy expenditure but in patients if you ask them to shake hands what happens the hand goes out and then they start coming ahead so that's what happens the degree of freedom is not controlled in these patients and that's why the task is more forceful effortful and lot of energy is expended and that's why they are not able to do it again and again you cannot repeat it so energy is conserved movement is selective and sequence and a lot of proportion of the movement is automatic so most of the movement you don't have to think ki i have to extend my elbow flex my shoulder most of it is automatic similarly in abnormal movement it is effortful because you start with the proximal component stiff and rigid inefficient you may not end up reaching for that individual where you have to shake hands slow and halting and non adaptable yeah so tone impairments two kinds of tone impairments less tone more tone if the tone is less you give them exercises to increase the tone if your activity of treatment is with increased tone if the tone is more and if the activity is like release where you need less tone you give them exercises which are going to reduce the tone in their body so tone influencing patterns are the patterns or movements which help you to regulate the postural tone at the same time elicit an active control of the same movement so it's not just the limb where you have to reduce the tone it's the overall body where you have to reduce the tone so that's why i have just mentioned few of the tone influencing patterns which help you to increase the tone like static weight bearing we have been doing this since years weight bearing on the limb it helps you to build up the tone symmetrical bilateral pattern holding a ball and bouncing 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 when you bounce the ball it helps up build up the tone in the abdominal muscles joint compression again it can be in space or it can be in weight bearing quick movements so if i do a quick movement and suddenly leave the limb in anticipation of avoiding the fall of the limb you end up building the tone protective reactions if a patient is sitting and suddenly you push the patient again in response to avoiding that fall he builds up the tone in his body so all these techniques can be used to build up the tone in the patient's body tips to tone influencing patterns to decrease the tone so it's very important to know when a patient comes to you with spasticity or high tone first and primary thing is to prepare the patient you need to do a lot of facial release you need to stretch the muscles release the fascia release the neural tissue and prepare the patient so that you can work on the tonal abnormalities so elongation and mobilization of muscle muscles and myofascia pressure on tendon insertions like a biceps tendon you just put deep pressure and you will see the let go in the tone in the biceps muscle after preparation coarse vibration and shaking which is a traditional manner of reducing tone where you hold the limb shake it in anterior posterior and lateral directions to let go the tone in the body 
gentle traction can be used for shoulder rotation around the body axis which is called as dissociation so dissociation is one of the most important uh, thing to reduce the tone in the body wide range of movements you know the synergy works in a very limited range the synergy is in a limited range when you go and work in wide range of movements you end up going out of the synergy and you end up breaking the synergy movements with facilitation which i am going to discuss in our practicals three main key points central key point which is your thorax around t7 t8 proximal key point is your shoulder your scapula your pelvis and your hip distal key points your hand and your fingers your both feet and your ankles nowadays elbows and knees are also considered as your distal key points why do we need to know the key points is we use these key points for facilitation now what is facilitation facilitation is or facilitation means to make a movement easy or to create a situation in in which a response has to take place so you are not going to do anything passive you are going to create a situation where the patient does a response or patient does that movement with your facilitations so i am going to show this in our practical so you will understand it better so now what do we facilitate we can facilitate two things either the movement as a whole or you can use the muscles which are responsible for that movement so you can facilitate the movement as a whole like rolling whole rolling you can facilitate or you can facilitate the muscles which are responsible for rolling what muscles help in rolling the obliques so you can facilitate the obliques to help the patient roll make sure when you facilitate your pressure is not strong enough to cause that passive movement it should be such that you look for automatic response the response has to come from the patient and last slide i wanted to discuss before we go to practical is what helps you to succeed in neuro rehab main important thing one is the neural drive neural drive there are two kinds of track the afferent tracks and the descending tracks afferent inputs the ascending tracks and the descending tracks sensory receptors now when a patient is paralyzed in a completely paralyzed limb the only way you can communicate with brain is by using the sensory receptors so there are four main sensory receptors mechanoreceptors golgi tendon organ muscle spindle and joint receptors so you need to know how to stimulate these receptors so mechanic mechano receptors can be stimulated just by giving wrinkling around the skin or the muscle bulb golgi tendon organ as we all know responds to vibration muscle spindle responds to stretch joint joint receptors responds to compression so you need to use these compressions vibrations small stretch <coughs> wrinkling around the skin to communicate with that brain in a paralyzed limb so this is how you communicate so you do a hands on via the proprioceptors using all these receptors sensory receptors so the impulse goes to the cerebellum first impulse through the cerebellum it goes to the thalamus which is called as the gatekeeper so thalamus is your main gatekeeper it will allow the impulse to go to cortical structure and if you see on the right side there is a impulse going to the body schema body schema is something which is the pixels <clears throat> like the pixels in the camera so every impulse coming in resolves the pixels so the picture keeps getting better as you get the impulses continuously and that's why repetitions play a big role in neuro rehab because you need to resolve the picture so that the picture becomes clear now from the cortical structures the descending impulse starts coming to the basal ganglia basal ganglia assesses the plan if it's a good plan it gives a go ahead if it's a bad plan it says no coming back to the second part of uh, success to neuro rehab minimize the demands the limb is completely paralyzed you telling the patient lift the limb lift the limb it's not going to help you have to minimize the demand on the limb so offer support to the limb eliminate gravity reduce friction use stimulations <clears throat> these things will help you to stimulate the contraction in that paralyzed muscle and one last thing is make use of the resources so resources are of two th two th types 
One is the patient's inbuilt resources, patient's cognition, patient's auditory system, patient's vision. All these things are inbuilt resources. Similarly, there are therapist resources like the therapist skills of assessment, therapist techniques, therapist equipments, all these things, the environment in which the patient works, all these are external resources which we need to make use so that we succeed in our neuro rehab. Now let's go to our practical session. I'm just going to stop my share screen. So now again, coming back to the key points, this is the central key point, upper limb, proximal key point, distal key point. Again, elbow is also considered as the distal key point. Similarly, for the lower limbs, this is the proximal key point, the hip. Knee is considered as the distal key point. It's not seen. Uh, ankle is also considered as the distal key point. Now, talking about the key points, why we need to know the key points is we need to know what relation do the key points have when you work. So, if I have to do a hip knee flexion movement, what relation do the key points have with each other? The distal key point is moving where? Is it moving away or is it moving towards the proximal key point and the central key point? So if you see in hip knee flexion, very easy, the distal key point is moving towards the proximal and towards the central key point. But if you see closely, normally the patient's limb, whenever we lie down, it's always into external rotation. So if it's external rotation, when you move, the distal key point first moves inside and then it starts moving towards the proximal and central key point. So this small movement you need to identify and that is the main thing about facilitation. You need to identify these small, small changes in the movements. So when you're facilitating, you have to give that slight inside push and then start pushing towards the proximal key point. Then only you will have that automaticity. Otherwise, it will be just a passive movement. So when you're facilitating a patient for hip knee flexion, your hand, one hand has to be on the distal key point, one hand has to be on the proximal key point and you are going to push the distal key point in and towards the proximal key point and you are going to push the proximal key point towards the central key point. So distal key point is moving in and towards the proximal and central and proximal key point is moving towards the central. So now if you see I'm facilitating you look for this automaticity in the leg. When you do it on patients, you will realize because they don't have movement and when you do it, you can make out the automaticity. In normals, it's very difficult to identify that automaticity. Let's come to the second technique of facilitation, bridging. Let's consider bridging. Again, this is the distal key point. When you tell the patient to bridge, the distal key point is fixed. So let's consider the knee as the distal key point. What happens when you bridge? The knee is moving away or towards the proximal and central key point. What is happening? The knee is moving forward or it's moving away from the proximal, away from the central key point. What is happening to the proximal key point here? What's happening when she's bridging? Very important to know, bridging, when you are training in neuro patients, it's a movement of hip extension, not back extension. So that if the hip has to extend, the pelvis has to go into a posterior pelvic tilt. And if the pelvis goes into a posterior pelvic tilt, the proximal key point has to move towards the central key point. That's very important. So when you're, when you're facilitating, one main thing is fixing this. Either you can fix it like this or you can sit on the limb and fix it. So the distal key point is fixed. You have to pull the distal key point, which is the knee, away from the proximal key point. The next hand of facilitation should be on the glutes because what muscle does hip extension? It is the gluteal muscle which does hip extension and it's a large muscle group. So if you don't use the muscle for facilitation, the bridging movement will not come. And as I told you in my lecture, you can facilitate either the movement 
or the muscle which is responsible for that movement. So one hand goes on the glutes, one hand is on the distal key point here and you push the glutes towards origin so that you engage the glute and then do bridging. This is facilitation of bridging using key points. Let's consider the third key point in sitting. Let's consider a forward reach. Now, let's have some upper limb key point control. Forward reach. This is the distal key point. Elbow again distal. Proximal key point. Central key point. What happens when you go for a forward reach? The distal key point is moving away from the proximal, away from the central. What happens with the proximal key point? What happens? Just see what's happening. It's moving towards the central key point. But if you again see closely, if it just moves towards the central key point, she won't be able to clear her limb from her trunk. And that's why you start the movement by slight abduction and then you start moving towards the central key point. So that small movement is again important. When you are facilitating, you will have to slightly pull the proximal key point away from the central key point and then start pushing it towards the central key point. So this is your guiding hand. The grip is again very important. The index finger comes from the ulnar end because all these patients when, with high tone have ulnar deviation. So when it comes from the ulnar side, I am blocking the ulnar deviation. So this is the grip which is important. The other hand comes on the proximal key point. Pull the proximal key point slightly away and start pushing it towards the central key point. Away and towards the central key point away and towards the central key point, away and towards the central key point. Another important prerequisite of forward reach is your anterior pelvic tilt. If a patient has to reach forward, there has to be an anterior pelvic tilt which has to happen. Most of our patients sit into a posterior pelvic tilt and that's why if they are not able to go into an anterior pelvic tilt, you will need one more therapist who helps her facilitate the anterior pelvic tilt. So that's very important. You cannot just go for forward reach without doing an anterior pelvic tilt. Another important thing is, as I told you, there is no fixed menu. There will be questions key. There will be shoulder subluxation if you do a forward reach. So there is no fixed menu. You, need, you are going to get a menu, but you need to identify whether this movement is suitable for your patient or no. So every patient, you cannot go for forward reach. Their shoulder needs to be a bit stable. That's important. One last technique I will show you because most of us worry about the gait. So you can actually plan your own techniques of Bobat if you are aware about the relationship of key points with each other. So that's very important. So now most of the patients, when they walk, they have a lot of clawing around the toes. And if you want to get rid of the cloying, you first have to think what happens, which phase of gait do the toes go into extension. So if you see the observational gait analysis, there is only one phase of gait where the toes have to extend, which is the terminal stance phase. So let's come to a position of terminal stance. Yeah. So this is the position of terminal stance. The leg is still in contact with the floor. So if you need to facilitate a terminal stance phase or you, if you need to facilitate to improve the toe clawing, your one hand goes around the toes, below the toes, but you are still in contact with the ground. Relationship of key points, again, terminal stance, going to free swing. What happens? The key points are moving. Distal key point is moving towards the proximal and towards the central. So you are going to hold one, one hand around the toes to facilitate that extension on the toes. One hand around the heel to push the distal key point towards the proximal and towards the central key point. And make sure when you're facilitating, you don't lose that contact because if you lose the contact with the floor, you are going to go into free swing free swing or <coughs> the initial swing. So don't lose the contact and just do this. And you will see after doing it immediately, if you make the patient walk, the toe clawing will reduce. 
but again you need to prepare the patient toe clawing comes when the patient is spastic and you need to reduce the tone so before giving this facilitation technique you need to prepare by elongating lengthening the muscles releasing the fascia releasing the neural tissue so all these things are important yes yeah remove this so coming back to uh, i would like to show some videos with this relation yes a hip knee flexion better this is a patient trying to do a hip knee flexion if you see his leg is into external rotation we are trying to facilitate the hip knee flexion post facilitation if you see he has a small attempt where you can actually see some hip knee flexion an attempt to hip knee flexion yes the next video is about one of the patients in my camps i was trying to first reduce the tone was not able to achieve that reduction in tone so i saw that he is building up a lot of tone so we thought about an activity which will come with building up the tone so we were trying to reach overhead you can see the range is not able to come up <clears throat> so we gave him activity which was increasing the tone in his body so we gave him activity of some biceps biceps as you all know helps to increase the tone because of the synergy it has lot of tone immediately after doing few repetitions so one more time correct right, he can go he can go much more higher the third video i'll just show of a patient who was who had gone into quadriplegia post heart transplant actually we have worked a lot on him and i just wanted to know what miracles a neuro rehab can do Using using the splints, bilateral L splints, forearm walker graduated to normal walker, unidirectional. One splint out. Both splints out. Attempt to walk independently. to walk independently using his hands also now and to jump That's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, such a practical-oriented uh, uh, session.